Yo, you're watching World Music Views with our brother, our guy, J.R. Watkins, live in Jamaica, y'all. Respect. You don't know. <laughs> <laughs> he wrote it out. He wrote the patois. <laughs> Music is the soundtrack of our daily lives. It drives business, it entertains, and we are that crucial link between the makers and users of music. We are Jams, representing local and international producers, labels and performers, providing global coverage in the collection of airplay and public performance royalties for the best of the best in the music industry. We deliver results. We deliver royalties. Find us at jamsonline.com or call 876-978-1010. Jams, we stand up for music rights. Yo! Yo, what's up, man? What's popping, Brendan? What's popping? What's popping? What's popping? Yo, everything good. Oh, everything God. good. Blessed. First of all, I, I want to say that I'm biased right now because I'm big fans of you and the show. So Appreciate that. I got to be toning down my fandom a little bit. <laughs> but I, I really respect what you do. Um, in fact, you guys inspired this podcast because where music views is about music and music business, which was a gap in the Caribbean music space. You know, as you know, a lot of it is informal and man just a boss a tune. <laughs> <laughs> so, so thank you for that. Since since watching you, like we start a chart show, we, we it's the first time Jamaica ever had numbers to know which song is popping before, you know, it's just boop, 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 and, and yeah, we'll get the most boop, boop, boop. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> so, Bridget, thank you so much. Thank you for your inspiration. But, but before we start, welcome to World Music Views. This is a oh, show it's... about music, music business, and we're just going to talk casually. We're, we're talking just like how you talk on your podcast. So, earn your leisure, assets over liabilities. I want to know where, first, introduce yourself, say your name, and tell me where you're from. Yeah, um, I'm Rashad, Rashad Bilal. Uh, Troy Millens. Yeah, we, we're from New York. Um, so, yeah, Earn Your Leisure, that's our brand, that's our podcast. Started as a podcast, and, you know, right now, I think the best way to describe it is just a movement, financial literacy movement community that covers everything from investing to business, entrepreneurship, culture, and uh, we just try to encompass all of that. Definitely, definitely. You're from Jamaica. Yeah, ah, man, don't, don't don't say it too loud. My my, my entire family's from here from from Kingston, so um, I always you know that's my my roots are here, and so yeah, I, I make no secret about that, man. Jamaica is home, and uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be back. Anytime we get, I get to come back, man, it's special. I didn't always know this. Like like you, you've integrated into the space, which is good. That you're able to coach it because that's why this show is not called Jamaica Music Views, it's called World Music Views. Because Mark Echo, who, who started Complex, he actually told me that it's best to create something with the Jamaican culture, but for the world. So, so mm -hmm. to, to see you able to code switch with that, um, how did you manage to integrate yourself? into the New York um, American space, although you have this cultural background. Yeah, so where, where, um, I was born in the Bronx. And so if you ever been to New York, you know, it's a huge West Indian culture. And so the section I, I, um, I was teaching in was predominantly Jamaican. And so I felt right at home because I had grown up in, um, around that. My uncle lived down the street from my school, but I was always teaching. And so what we do now is it's still teaching, it's still educating, it's just in a different platform. And so once I was able to reach the kids while I was working, I knew the same like you, what you said, it, it's not just for one culture, it's for the entire world. We knew that if, if we said things and we broke things down and we explained things in a way that the people that we're around, could, we could, they could understand, we knew the world would be receptive to that. Because there's more people that want to be in the space, they just haven't heard the language explained to them in a way that they can understand. And how did you link up with Rashad? I want to hear from Rashad. How did you link up? Yeah, I mean, we grew up together. We're from the same neighborhood. So I, he moved to my neighborhood probably when, like, I think he was, like, probably 14. I was, like, 12. So, you know, we come from a real small community. Everybody knows each other. So, really, it was just a matter of us just, you know, living a couple of streets down from each other, going to the same school, same high school, playing on the same basketball team, having the same friends. And we just became friends. So that was really just, um, you know, just childhood, just community. And um, a lot of the guys that even was with still with Earn Your Leisure to this day are people that we grew up with. So 
you know, that's just, um, you know, like any anybody's upbringing, you know, you, you, you meet childhood friends and sometimes you're fortunate to actually keep those friends for life. So you have a lot of hip hop guests on your show and, and hip hop culture on your show. I, I love the Rick Ross episode, by the way. Um, <laughs> Every day I'm, every day I'm, every day I'm hustling. 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 Every day, every day, every day I'm hustling. Who the fuck you think you fucking with? I'm the fucking boss. Seven forty-five, white on white, that's Ricky Ross. I cut him hard, I cut him long, I cut him fast. I'm like Atlantic. I got them motherfuckers flying across the Atlantic. I know Pablo, Noriega, the real Noriega. He owe me a hundred favors. I ain't petty, nigga. We buy the whole thing. See, most of my homies, they really still up. My roof back, my money right. I'm on the pedal to show you what I'm running like. When they snatch black, I cry for a hundred nights. He got a hundred bodies serving a hundred lives. Every day I'm hustling. Every day I'm hustling. But there's this discussion happening in America. It's happening in Jamaica. Like, like who started hip hop? Like, is it, <laughs> was it Jamaicans who started hip hop or this was an American culture? What, are, what is your thought? Hey, so hip hop was created in the Bronx by Kool Herc, right? Kool Herc is of Jamaican descent. So if we break it down by that standard, technically it was created by Jamaicans, right? Even the boom bap, the sound comes from it. Um, so I will say, yes, Jamaicans created it, and I might be biased, but yeah, Cool Herc is, is known as the, the founding father of it uh, from Cedric Ave in the Bronx. So Jamaicans that have a, a large imprint on the culture. Yeah, for sure. And I probably think, you know, New York, understanding New York is a, it's a melting pot. So, um, you know, we all kind of grow up together and whether it's Puerto Ricans, whether it's Dominicans, Jamaicans, Haitians, African-Americans. So, yeah, Jamaicans have been there from the beginning. I think KRS One is Jamaican also. Mm -hmm. um, of course, the notorious B.I.G. is Jamaican. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, some of the greatest of all time. And yeah, the, the early stages, like you said, um, definitely. But there's other people that's involved in building the, the, the bricks of hip hop. And those some of those people were Puerto Rican. Some of those people was African-American. Some of those people were Jamaican. So, yeah, Jamaican flag is definitely uh, in, implanted in, <laughs> in the fabric of hip hop. You cannot take that away. And I think, you know, it just goes back to it all comes back to Africa, really. You know, we all come from Africa originally. And, um, you know, whether it's Afro beats, whether it's reggae, dance hall, um, hip hop, all of that kind of is variations of drum patterns and rhymes and, you know, going back to where we originally came from. So, you know, um, we, we, we spread all over the different world in a different diaspora, but um, ultimately we all family. That's one of the reasons why we wanted to come to Jamaica, not only is Troy from Jamaica, but, you know, that's one of our goals is really to connect the whole entire planet, as you said, the whole world. And, you know, we have a lot more in common than we have not in common. It's just a matter of just matching it up and just, you know, creating that dialogue. And then we realize that, you know, we all have different parts to play in each other's culture. So when I saw that you were in Jamaica with Usain Bolt, I, I, I reached out to, Usain Bolt was my last, not last guest, like two guests ago, it was Usain Bolt. So when I saw you were in Jamaica, I'm like, yo, I need your <laughs> <laughs> Right on, but, but definitely welcome home, boss. Even you, Rashad, welcome home. Jamaica is your home. He got a he got a Jamaican uh, side to him, right? He's around us so much that he is an honorary Jamaican. He know all the now, fools, the culture. Now, Dev, <laughs> you have a lot of fans in Jamaica too. Just so you know, I don't know how the experience has been with you on the street, but especially in the entrepreneurs and educated people, we are like in tune with what you're doing because it's like we're the grown ups now. We grew up on Tupac, we grew up on hip hop, we grew up on Biggie Smalls, but now. 
we have businesses. We we have so so you're like right in the the zone of of what we're interested in. So so you have a lot of fans out here. You should consider you doing a, a live show out here. I'm putting I that out there. We got an event out here. And we got to connect offline because uh, we was actually it was too short notice this time, but we're gonna come back because we was number one on the charts out here. So we definitely want to yeah. come back out here and do something for sure. Yeah, no oh, fans. So you know. We we only got family. <laughs> we don't have no fans. All family. Good, good, good to go. So the, the Jamaican culture, right? A lot of artists from Jamaica want bus. They, they want to break. I saw where you went to Sherlock Crescent with, with, with Damien, with, with Cham yesterday, and people were performing for you, like, yeah. impromptu, right? That, that's part of what we are as Jamaican. But I've seen that in New York, too. Um, how do you suggest a Jamaican who's an artist, break into the international scene. Now, we have a couple of women signed to major labels, Shensia, Spice, Jada Kingdom. They're signed to major labels who want to push them out. How do you suggest that marketing and rollout happen for them coming from a different culture? Um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting because we just, you know, still kind of learning about what's going on out here with dance hall and reggae. But I definitely would take the path, if you can, of of getting hot in the, in the, the areas that Jamaicans are spread out across the diaspora. So, of course, you have New York City, you have Florida, you have Toronto, Canada, and you have London. Those are like, you know, four major hubs for Caribbean, especially Jamaican people. So, you know, Jamaican influence is real big in New York. So a lot of the stuff that we hear um, are Jamaican artists, but you know some Jamaican artists make a stronger push in trying to be known in America. So mm -hmm. you know from my from my point of view, of course you have to be popular in your hometown. That's extremely important. You got to do that first and, and be popular in your country. But then after that, I would reach out to artists, and it doesn't have to be even major artists in America, but like even artists that's up and coming in America, and create that that bridge like. I love when um, Popcorn, he did a song with Dave East. Like Dave East isn't, isn't like a superstar artist, but he's an underground artist and he's, he has a buzz in, in the city. So it would make sense for them to, to connect on that level because it's like, all right, he has a buzz in New York. I'm really hot in Jamaica. Let's combine that and, you know, let's expand my fan base and expand his fan base over here. So I think collaboration is extremely important, even with, um, with uh, um, Afrobeats. I think that that's one of the reasons why Afrobeats is on fire right now because there's a lot of collaboration between American artists and African artists and the, and the London-based artists. And um, you see that a lot. And now the Afrobeats is getting played on the radio in, in America mm -hmm. way more than dancehall or reggae. Dancehall and reggae is not really getting mainstream radio play right now. And I think one of the reasons why is because there isn't a lot of crossover um, mm -hmm work that's just my opinion yeah I and mean, that's something we used to see like the early 90s mid 90s definitely 2000s when dance hall like took over the scene it was the world music um but he said what he said is key man get hot where you are when you when you become hot where you are and it's great that we get to see sham in his neighborhood because you can see the influence from being a young child to being a, a, a young man to being a superstar if you get hot where you are the world will find you and so collaboration is part of that in collaborating, do you think the Jamaican artist should should try to be American and code switch on that, or they should stay authentic? No, I think you got you got to stay authentic to who you are. And I, like I said, I mean, the Jamaican influence in America is so strong that you don't really have to like you know. It's enough people that identify with the culture, even if they're not Jamaican, that they appreciate it. Like, you know what I mean? So, yeah. and I, you see the success in major Jamaican artists that have had huge careers. In, in America. Um, so I don't necessarily think you have to go that route, but I just think that you just have to, um, and even Drake, like, you know what I mean? Like if you look at Drake, he has a huge, huge influence in with his J Jamaican, um, you know, <laughs> he, 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 he connects with. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah, he's yeah. another one who's honorary. So, so, so <laughs> I feel like, you know, you could be authentic to who you are. Yeah. Maybe, you know, add certain elements that make you a little bit more um, mm -hmm. acceptable in different markets. That's just, you know, I wouldn't necessarily call that code switching. That's just more so like, you know, knowing where you're actually at. Same thing with us. Like, you know, when we come to Jamaica, we connect with people that are in Jamaica, you know, um, because obviously that's that's where we are right now. So obviously we're based in America, but we don't want to just bring our way of thinking and our culture here. Mm -hmm. We want to accept the culture that's here 
and embrace the culture that's here. So um, yeah. I can, think it's the same way with music. You can hear it. I'm, I'm glad you brought up Drake because you can hear it in his his music, right? You can see Toronto has a large West Indian population. His sound has that culture in it, even though he's not from it, but he's around it enough that it's like, you know, this is now Toronto culture because it's a big West Indian. Same thing in New York, same thing in Miami, like you said, in London. There's huge hubs for West Indian and Caribbean artists. Um, so staying authentic to who you are because the people who are in these cities come from the place where you are and they want to hear that authentic sound. Yeah, and, and you know what? I, I, I don't know if artists realize in 1916 when Marcus Garvey landed in New York, one in five New Yorkers were from the West Indies. One in five. And, and that, that lineage carried over to, to like a lot of people are descendants of West Indies heritage. So like, I don't get the idea of, of trying to cross over. But let me ask you about the switch. What are your thoughts on cultural appropriation? Like white guys doing reggae music, not paying homage. Not DJ Khaled. DJ no, no, Khaled. No, no, no. We're not going to do that. Shout out to Khaled. <laughs> I feel like, you know, like, you know, I went to school in Hawaii. So um, if you've ever been to Hawaii, you know that um, reggae. I was there last year or a year before. Especially the Marlies. Ziggy Marley. They have a huge, huge influence in Hawaii. Like you got, and I, I saw white people with dreads that was rosters and they was white. And I don't necessarily feel like um, they was taken from the culture. I really feel like they had a strong appreciation of the culture and it really showed me how strong that influence was. Cause I'm like, I'm all the way out in Hawaii and these people is white and they listening to Bob Marley and Ziggy Marley and they got dreadlocks and they talking like they're from Jamaica. So um, I think that it's a thin line. <laughs> it's a thin line between appreciation and appropriation. Um, because, you know, we're all influenced by different things. Like even me, like I might be influenced by certain elements of different cultures and I'm African-American yeah. um, and other people are influenced by African-American culture. So, you know, I look at it like, you know, paying homage and um, being influenced by something is just natural. Yeah. Now, taking advantage of something and, you know, misusing it and profiting off of it the wrong way is something that all cultures, you know, yeah. especially, you know, in America, like, you know, that's been happening for our culture forever where people take what we do and remix it and and package it up and make billions of dollars. So it's important for us to understand, even talking about the business side of things, it's important to understand that our culture, when I say our culture, I'm talking about all cultures, we move different parts of the world. So, you know, we're very generous people. When I say we, I'm talking about all black people, like, you know, by nature, we're, we're genuine. We don't really think about business per se, whether it's Africa, whether it's America, whether it's in the Caribbean, like we just give stuff away. The problem with that is that we give so much stuff away and we never actually benefit mm -hmm. from it. And then you have record labels and you have culture vultures and you have other people that make millions of dollars and billions of dollars off the, off of the dances, off of the music, off of the culture that we created. So it's extremely important for us to keep exporting our culture and keep spreading that love but understand that everything is a business, including culture. And we need to capitalize and we need to understand that if this culture is going to be spread all across the world and people are going to take to it and adapt it, um, A, they need to respect it and do it the right way. And then B, the creators of it need to be the first ones that can actually profit from it. Yeah, I was just going to say that. I was, I thought he was going to do his patois. But <laughs> I guess he's gonna save it. But no, nah, I mean, and, and somebody said this to us yesterday. It was like, look, we created dancehall, we created reggae, and we are the people who have. I'm just talking for Jamaican culture. We are the people who have uh, benefited from it the least, right? Because we don't have the, the major record label, right? Like Madhouse is a, is a big studio here, but it's not Sony Records. It's not Universal, and so. The fact that we're having this conversation and what you're doing is important, what we're doing is important because we're going to put people in those positions that they create the structure that we can monetize and we can do things appropriately. Yeah, we can share. But we want to make sure that we take care of our people first. So I'm, I, this is like in queue with what I'm doing. I'm dropping a book next month, September, Cultural Capital into Financial Capital, not just in music, but sports. You, where you, you were with you saying yesterday. You saying is the king of monetizing this? Like he he knows how to do that. How do you suggest artists, dancers, um, other people in the culture who who that's all they have? The only thing they have that that makes them unique is their culture. How do you suggest they monetize it? 
Yeah, I think collaboration is extremely important. And I was just, it's crazy. I was just having this conversation the other day with a friend of mine, and I was talking about rappers in America. Rappers in America, they're having a hard time monetizing, monetizing their craft um, because, like, music is so cheap right now, and, you know, shows are even cheaper. Um, so it's kind of difficult, but I was saying that we need them and they need us. Like, they need us because they need help with the financial guidance. They need help with higher ticket items. And we need them because we understand that culture, no matter how much we try to fight it, culture is still predominantly moved by music, sports, entertainment. So we have to work with each other. So I think the first thing is for entrepreneurs to work with athletes and, and entertainers and not take advantage of them, but to educate them. on how can you how can you monetize your craft? How can you have higher ticket items, right? Where it's like, okay, uh, if you are a rapper or a musician, like the lower ticket item is to actually get people just to buy your music. That's either free or it's like 99 cents. So it's very low profit margins on music these days. But now you can create a community where obviously the next thing is like merch. Okay, that's the obvious thing. But what if you had a paid subscription service where it's like, okay, maybe 5% of your members will pay you $10 a month and now you jump on Zoom calls and you kind of, you know, can, even I love what Jim Jones is doing where he created a virtual studio um, where now he's, he's giving people verses and he's giving people um, virtual engineering and you don't, you could be anywhere in the world and get the engineering services. So I think it's about thinking outside of the box, but um, the, the element that we're in right now with online and everything being digital has created a lot of opportunity, whether it's in the cryptocurrency space, whether it's um, virtual events, whether it's, you know, subscription services where you actually have more um, engagement with your hardcore fans. This is something that Ryan Leslie was mm -hmm. talking about as well, where you don't really necessarily need millions and millions of fans to become wealthy. You just need a core niche group and you have to have a system in place. So like with him, he sold his album, I think for like $10, but he didn't, he didn't put it on any streaming services at all. So he understood that he's going to reach a lot less people. But the theory is that the diehard fans are going to pay $10. Yeah. That $10 goes directly to him. Yeah. Or even Nipsey Hussle, when Nipsey had that $100 mixtape, right? It's like the idea of having a $100 mixtape is something that people probably would have laughed at. But it was very successful and it was an extremely successful marketing plan. And that was one of the things that really catapulted him into mainstream success. Yeah. So I think it's about at this point in time for cultural people to start thinking outside the box and realizing that, you know, there, there are value adds, but you have to figure out how can I have higher ticket items? How can I have my diehard fans tap in with me? So now like Patreon is a big thing. Like even you see Joe Biden, he's been having on Patreon where now people are realizing that people will pay to see the behind the scenes aspects. Mm -hmm. They will pay to see a little bit more than what anybody else sees. So now it's like, okay, you got this song, but what about the behind the scenes of how you made the song? Okay. Or what about some bonus features and things like that? It's all about innovation. So everything you said is, is dead on, right? It, it, and I think uh, Ryan's thing was he had $40, but it was an experience. He's selling an experience. And so with the album, now you get the ticket to the show when I go on tour, right? Now, if I sell it for $100, now you might be able to come watch me record my song live. It's about creating an experience that nobody else can have. Because you don't need, a lot of times people think that they would need to be superstars or they need to be like this sensation. And all you really need is a core following. That's it. You need a core following that's dedicated to the message that you're giving and you're going to be providing them with value. And so creating those experiences that are unique, that no one else can have is going to separate you. And, that, and that's something that Usain was talking to us about yesterday, right? He knew these things going in. He knew that if he danced and he, he was a little like boisterous when he got on the track, he would separate himself because everybody when they run looks nervous, especially when they see him. And so when he shows himself so relaxed, it's like, wait, this guy's different. And he has orange cleats on and it's because the yams that he eats. And it's like, oh, wait, there's more to this. So he becomes even more marketable because he's showing you his experience. And then on the back end, he's going to provide the value by winning, winning a lot of races. Your podcast is one of the most successful in the world. Are you going to list it on the stock market? And how do you suggest that happen? For yeah, other people. Uh, this is a selfish question, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the EYL ticket definitely has to happen. I mean, yeah, it started as a podcast, but now it's grown into so many different um, 
elements. We have a podcast network. We have an educational division with the EYL University. Um, so that definitely is something that could possibly happen. It just depends on which element would be listed, whether it's the network, whether it's a private equity firm, whether it's, uh, you know, edu- the educational department. Um, but yeah, EYL, the ticker EYL, I think is something that would be dope and very inspirational for people to see, you know, us starting, you know, from humble beginnings, iPhones and in his dining room to be on a stock exchange. I think that that would be something that would be really, really dope. So to answer your question, definitely. Soon come. <laughs> um, it, it's just a matter of which division would make the most sense to take public or the whole entire company take public. But I think that that's something that would be extremely powerful. And this is a, a human interest question. Like, how do you manage to get along? Because a lot of times, like, we see Joe Budden, we see a <laughs> bunch of other people, and you're successful. How do you manage to keep, you know, the annoyances away and focus on the goal and, and, and be in harmony? And, and you both seem to genuinely get along. You're on the Zoom early in the morning. People yeah. don't do that with people they don't want to get along with. So yeah, yeah. how do you get along? We, we've known each other for over 25 plus years and we pretty much talk every day. Um, so it, it's, it's pretty easy. It's a natural fit. Um, and he has strengths and I have strengths and he has weaknesses. And wherever he's weak at, I try to like, all right, well, I need to be better at this. And so we kind of balance each other at, uh, balance each other out about that. And so when I know he's gifted at, I don't, try, I don't have to be gifted at that. Right. Like that's my brother. He's a genius at it. I'm going to let him be a genius. And he trusts me to be a genius in another aspect. And so we never try to step on each other's toes because we know what the end goal is. We know what the mission is. We know the value that we both bring. Um, and we, we know what we need to bring our community. And so you'll never see bickering between us because we know it's bigger than us. This movement started in our, in our um, my dining room, but it's for the world. And so we know that the, the task at hand and we take it very seriously. So you, you won't see any infighting from any of these. That, that's just not something we built on. It's not something we've ever had. I think we probably had like maybe one or two arguments, not even arguments, heated discussions in 25 years. And it probably was about sports or something about rap. Like not, <laughs> nothing personal. Yeah. Like who was the best MC, Biggie, yeah, JC, yeah, or yeah. That, that was way better. You crazy? <laughs> so, so that's a good segue. Who, who are you listening to? Who are your top five, first of all? Give me your top five favorite hip-hop artists and then top five favorite reggae dancehall artists. Um, Ever or currently? Say that again? Ever or currently? Both. Give me, give me ever and give me current. I mean, for me, top five artists that I, you know, listened to just growing up in inspiration: Nas, uh, Jay Z, uh, Kanye, Drake, and um, I probably put A Z. That's like a personal favorite of mine. Like, who really? Hold I, up! Did you say you listened to Drake growing up? How old are you? Oh, no, 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 I said top five, top five, top five. Top five. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> all time, all time. So that's, that's, my, that's my top five. And then for dance, so I'm going to be honest, I ain't really listen to a lot. I got them, I got them. I'll take but it. Nah, but I got, a couple, I got a couple people that I like. Um, I mean, of course, the, the late great Bob Marley as far as reggae, that's, you know, I think he's the greatest of all time. Um, he's a major inspiration. Like I said, when I was, listening to, when I was in Hawaii, I do like Damian Marley a lot. Um, I got into his music a lot. I like Damian Marley. And um, I like Popcorn, uh, like for the newer artists. I listen to him sometimes. Um, so, yeah, I mean, of course, Bob's Cartel. Growing up in New York, you hear a lot of Bob's Cartel. You hear a lot of Beanie Man, Bounty Killer, stuff like that. But um, I, I more so like just listen to it. I didn't really like buy the music and was really, really into it that much. Yeah. Oh, so you're one of them that's not buying dancehall music. <laughs> Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, my top five, uh, Jay, Nas, uh, Big, Pac, um, I'll put, I, it's a, my fifth is like a Drake and Wayne. I think I, I love those guys' music um, growing up. It's Wayne specifically, we're the same age. And so watching him grow and to ascend to the heights that he, he got to and obviously introducing the world to Drake, um, they're like a top of five. Uh, as far as, Dancehall reggae. Um, I'm, my, I grew up on old school, so um, Barris Hammond was playing every Sunday in my house. My dad's a huge Barris Hammond fan. He was uh, doing the he was doing the dance like this. <laughs> yo, I was I did it yesterday. It was like yo, no, no, if you if you from a certain era, you know that's how people move. 
That's how the yard man moves. Got it, the so, one skunk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And if they get, if, if they get the, if they do the stomp with the leg, you in trouble. You know you in trouble because I don't know what you're gonna do next if they do the stomp on you. Um, <laughs> so Barrett Heaven for sure, Barrington Levy for sure. Uh, early '90s Shaba was was huge growing up in the um in in New York. Uh, Beanie Man, Love, Bounty Killer. Uh, I even love Sean Paul. I thought Sean Paul was dope. Sean Paul had some records that that just would turn the party upside down. Um, I remember Ninja Man was was a thing. Ninja Man was yeah, like you grew up. I, I wanted out. to be. I wanted to be Ninja Man growing up. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That was a fool. Yeah, Ninja Man. Uh, my barber, shout out to Rex. Um, Gunnett Silk was somebody big that he always played in the barbershop. Obviously, the Marlies. Um, yeah, it's a lot, man. It's a lot. And don't forget Patrick. Remember Patrick? Patrick was huge. Queen out of the pocket. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Patrick. people don't know. People Baby don't know that Lil' that Kim's whole style is Patro. So, they, and the like, crazy thing that they were in the One More Chance video was big. Yeah, 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 yeah. She, I was watching um, her Queen of the Pot video yesterday, Romantic Call, and Tupac was in the, 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 the drop top with her. I'm like, yeah, this yeah, is yeah. some legendary shit. And this <laughs> seemed like, this seemed like Tupac wasn't even a big artist at the time. And I'm like, yeah. Tupac was just in the back, like, like checking her Patra, like just a little extra in the back. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Those, those, they'll, if, if, if you're from there, you, you know, like, you can see the influence, like the little Kim's of Foxy Brown. Lady Saw was talking all that before all of them. Yeah, yeah. I shouldn't yeah. have been listening at that time. I apologize to my parents. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a good, that's a good, good list. I like that Jay's at the top. Jay's my favorite artist of all time. Like, um, I could find a Jay-Z for every mood, every time. And what I love, just like you guys, like you're for the mature me. Like I had ambitions of becoming who I am now. And I'm, I'm, I'm here. Jay is that. Because Jay was not one 900 hustler when I was young. And, and, and I'm a hustler, baby. And you know, you're having fun. But now Jay's talking about 444 relationship, which I also have. And everybody in my age group also have. So, so I love when... My artists grow with me, and he's mm -hmm. one of them that, that definitely did that. Your podcast, Assets Over Liabilities. Last question. Tell us some assets that people definitely need to have right now, and tell us some liabilities that they need to let go. Yeah, um, I mean, I'll tell you, assets, it, it goes a lot of different directions. It's like a play on words. But, of course, if we're talking about investments, Crypto, um, you should definitely be knowledgeable about crypto. The stock market is something that we are extremely, you know, passionate about in real estate. So that's like the holy trinity right there. Crypto, stocks, real estate. Can't really go wrong, in my opinion, if you really are knowledgeable and you and you focus on that. But even bigger than that, as far as being an asset to people, providing value, um, keeping your word, and um, having a high level of integrity, these are things that's like makes you an asset to people. And it was crazy because, you know, I was uh, talking to another one of our friends yesterday, shout out to Alex. And um, um, we, you know, we just hanging out with Usain and Shane. And I'm just like, you know, the podcast is a great networking tool. And he was like, yeah, it, it, it gives you a value add. Like you're not just here to hang out. You're here to provide value, to interview them, which uh, millions of people is going to see. So now you become an asset to them as opposed to this probably thousands of people that just want to hang out and just add no value so we found a way to actually add value and now we you know we can hang out and we and we connect with people that you know we probably would have never had an opportunity to connect with if it wasn't for our platform so yeah you're world music views bro yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> nah, it's, it's a privilege for me to be talking to you earn your legend because you you don't know how much you have inspired me so so that's definitely a big thing continue sorry sorry i cut you off yeah so like i said that's just some assets um that i think from a business standpoint and just also from a personal standpoint yeah as far as liabilities obviously the, the obvious ones is, is debt and credit card debt probably being number one america and i'm not sure what the situation here is with student loan debt is is a huge one but again people people can become liabilities. And I, I, somebody was telling me this and it, it made perfect sense. They were like, you gotta treat sometimes relationships like your bank account. How long will you allow people to take withdrawals without ever making a deposit? And so if we st start thinking about that, a lot of our relationships might be in the red right now 
You know what I mean? Like we want to make sure that they're at least even um, because if they're not, then it's, it's a weight on you. And so we, we so there's people that are in our lives and I know for sure for me and I'm sure for you and Shadi as well that have just taken and taken and taken with no deposits or, or any value add. And so we need to really evaluate these relationships and say, do I need them and are they benefiting us or benefiting my family um, going forward? Wow, wow, beautiful. I love that, I love that. Let's wrap up. Welcome to Jamaica, boss. And yeah. I look forward to earn your leisure Jamaican style. Oh, yeah, and, definitely. and any help you want with that, um, you know, so I got your, you. What's your Instagram? Um, JR Watkins. You should see me sending you messages, following you. You should see me like tagging you in, in videos like I'm driving and watching Earn Your Leisure. Yeah. Oh, I see you. I see you. If you look in your message, you're supposed to see me. The Steve Stout episode was like remarkable for me. Oh, uh, thank you. Because Steve has been a, a far distant mentor for all that independent stuff. And, and that, that episode was, was remarkable. If you check your message, you'll see me I see, I see tagging you. Wrote, tagging you, wrote, you. Yes. Yeah. No, look yeah. above that. Like, this was June 11. I was listening and a couple of people messaged me like, yo, they're like the best podcast. Yeah. <laughs> but yo, it. thank you so much, man. Yeah, let's definitely mm -hmm. connect. We definitely want to yeah. back out here sometime in the fall do an event a networking event or something like that out here so yeah man yeah man we'll do that we'll do that all right bless up boss respect appreciate you all right all right yeah man big up yo what's up this is earn your leisure and you are listening to world music views with jr watt kiss our guy our brethren so it's been an honor and a pleasure make sure you check it out